Hi, welcome everyone. This is just a video going through the test we did a couple of weeks ago. A few people asked me to make a video so you could just go on the questions you needed to. So feel free to skip through. Um, pause if you want to have a go. Of course, you can watch things twice if you're not quite sure where I got things from. I'll do my best to be as quick and as clear as I can. Okay, this first question then was applying F equals MA. So the force was 4. The mass converted to kilograms is 0 0.05. Okay, and then if you divide through you should get 80 meters per second squared for the acceleration. Most of you managed to get that one right. Question two was a moments question. Uh, the biggest mistake here was uh, putting the, the mass of the beam in the wrong place. So the mass of the beam always acts in the center unless you're told it's non-uniform. Okay, this is a uniform beam, so the mass is in center. The mass is 24 kilograms times it by 9.8 to get the weight and you get 235.2 newtons the distance here from where I'm going to take my moments is 0.7 and that's because the beam is 3 meters long the midpoint is 1.5 uh, we've got 0.8 already so we've got 0.8 left okay then if I take moments around uh, my pivot point C We've got our mass here, so if I put 9.8 m for the weight of, uh, of the mass. Take your moments around C, we've got anti-clockwise 9.8 m times 0.8, which is the distance, which is 7.84 m. And then that's equal to the clockwise moments because we're in equilibrium. So that's 235.2 times 0.7 which is 164.64 and if you divide through you should get that the mass is exactly 21 kilograms just remember it's weight not mass and uh, the mass of a, of a beam if it's uniform acts at the center and it's just force times distance and anti-clockwise equals clockwise if you are in equilibrium okay on to question three then this was uh, adding up the three forces in I and J vector form. Okay, so it is very simply just a case of add up the I's and add up the J's. So adding up the I components, you should get 33I. And adding up the J components, you get minus 11J. Now it says find the magnitude. Hopefully we know by now that working with vectors, if you're asked to find a magnitude, that is the hypotenuse of whatever triangle your vector makes so our vector is 33 i minus 11 j so we've got 33 on the top there we've got 11 going down there you can leave the minus out when you're doing pythagoras because squaring would get rid of it anyway so the square root of 33 squared plus 11 squared you should get 34.8 newtons okay for the force then part two is to find the angle. So it's the same triangle. So this is 33, this is 11, but this time it wants us to find the angle that the resultant makes with the horizontal, so that's in there. And that's gonna be tan minus one, because I've got the opposite and the adjacent of 11 over 33. And that comes out as 18.4 degrees. Most of you did well on this question, to be fair. And then the last one says, in vector form, give another force that would keep the object in equilibrium. Well, if you remember, originally we had 33i minus 11j. Um, and if we want to keep it in equilibrium, we need like the sort of the opposite of that. So our extra force F4 will be minus 33i plus 11j. That question would have been a lot harder if they had asked us to give it as a force with a bearing, okay, because you would have needed to take your Pythagoras answer from earlier and also put it onto a sort of a north north arrow and work out your bearing from north. But that was okay in vector form. Now the next one caused a few problems. Okay, there's quite a lot going on in this question, and there's a couple of ways you can write it all down. So I'll do it all sort of twice-ish. First thing to notice up here is we were told that tan alpha is three quarters. They don't want you to do inverse tan and find alpha. What they want you to realize is that you've got a, 
a three, four, five triangle there. Um, I'm looking you know, she's done a couple of these, so you should get the sine alpha is three fifths and cos alpha is four fifths. And the idea of that is to make the calculations much easier for us when we start doing things like mg sine alpha and mg cos alpha, okay, which we're about to do in a second. So we've got this particle of mass m, and don't worry about not knowing the mass because it will all cancel out later on anyway. Uh, it's moving up the slope with a deceleration. Now, if it's a deceleration, it means it's in the opposite direction to motion, which means it's actually accelerating down the slope with four fifths g. Okay. I'll work this all through in terms of g first. We can do it again with numbers later on. Okay, the first force that you should definitely be adding on, or the first two forces, is your mg sine alpha and your mg cos alpha. Okay, so alpha's down here. So we've got mg sine alpha going down the slope, parallel, and we've got mg cos alpha, which is perpendicular. Taking our values from over here of sine alpha and cos alpha, you get 3 fifths mg parallel to the slope, and we get 4 fifths mg perpendicular to the slope. The next force we should add on should be R, our normal contact force. Now, because there are no other forces uh, acting in the perpendicular direction, we can simply say that R is equal to 4 fifths mg. There are questions later on on this test where that is not the case. Okay, But in that direction, perpendicular to the plane, there are only two forces. They have to be equal to each other. So R is 4 fifths mg as well. Um, we know that we've got some friction, okay, because we're told the coefficient of friction is mu, and we've got to find mu. Now, if the object is moving up the slope, okay, I know we're decelerating, the acceleration is down, but the object is moving up the slope, then friction is acting down the slope, so I can put mu r in there, okay, and we can use r from here, look. So that'll be four fifths mg when I start doing my workings. Okay, now you need to be consistent here with direction and sign. Um, I would say since it's moving up the slope and decelerating, anything down the slope is a negative. So we've got, going down the slope, we've got our minus 3 fifths mg, that's mg sine alpha, that's the sort of part of the weight component if you like. We've got mu r, now, that's 4 fifths mg times mu. So 4 fifths mg mu. A lot of this will cancel out. Notice there's no positive forces, just the two negative forces, forces that are slowing our object down. And that's equal to then uh, ma, and that's down the slope as well. So minus 4 fifths mg. Okay mg will cancel out from every term, okay, the fifths will cancel out from every term, so you've got minus 3, minus 4 mu equals minus 4, if you bring the minus 3 over and add it, you get minus 4 mu equals minus 1, the minuses cancel out when you divide it, and you get a quarter. You would have got the same answer if you were taken down as positive. Okay, as long as you're consistent, it doesn't really matter. If I do it the same thing but with uh, numbers, I know, I mean, I'm not a big fan of working in terms of G unless I really have to. Um, so, working in terms of G, uh, 3 fifths mg is minus 5.88 m. The, the friction term, the 4 fifths of, of G, is minus 7.84 and that's m and a mu in there as well and then on the other side we've got the same number so minus 7.84 and that's just m okay similarly then m's cancel out this time we're left with minus 5.88 minus 7.84 mu equals minus 7.84 work that through you'll get exactly the same thing 0.25 or a quarter
Okay. Uh, so that's the first part. Uh, the second part, we're going to need a new diagram, but I'm going to recycle a lot of this. Okay, so on my new diagram, we're asked to say whether the object will come back down or stay when it when it eventually does stop. So it's sliding up, it's slowing down. When it does stop, they're asking us, will it stay there or will it come back down? So when it's coming back down, or if it's going to come back down, we've still got our mg sine alpha term. Okay, so that's either 3 fifths mg or if you prefer 5.88m. That's still acting down the slope. Okay, we've still got um, our mg cos alpha term, so that's 4 fifths mg. We've still got R acting upwards, which is also 4 fifths mg. And the crucial difference now, because the block wants to slide back down the slope, now whether it does or not, we'll check in a minute, but it wants to slide back down the slope, mu R has switched directions. And remember, we now know that mu is a quarter. So when I'm doing mu R now, then it's a quarter times 4 fifths mg which just gives you one fifth mg, one fifth mg, okay, you can write this 1.92 m if you like, if you want to get rid of the g, the 9.8, and very simply all you've got to say now is by comparing forces in a perpendicular direction, the forces going down the slope are bigger than the friction force going up the slope, so therefore it will slide back down. Okay. If mu had been higher, then our friction term could have been greater than 5.88 m, and then it would have stayed exactly where it was. Okay. So just be careful. Just compare your forces up the slope and down the slope for that one. Okay. Um, next question, we've got a box on a flat surface, horizontal, it's being pulled with a force of 50 newtons. So if I put a little arrowhead on there, that's 50 newtons. Um, any forces at angles needs to be sort of split into its components. So this will be 50 sine 40, okay, or if you prefer 32.14 newtons. Uh, this will be 50 cos 40. And that is 38.3 newtons. Okay. We've also obviously got the weight of the object uh, acting down, and that's 78.4 newtons, 8 times 9.8. Uh, this is where we're slightly different. So we've got a normal contact force acting upwards, but we've also got, look over here, 32.14 newtons acting upwards as well so we've got two forces acting upwards r plus 50 sine 40 and we've got one force acting down with 78.4 we have to be in equilibrium so the two forces acting upwards are equal to the force acting downwards or if you rearrange it r is 78.4 minus because it'll be smaller because we've got two forces acting upwards R50 sine 40 term. Okay, you could leave it like that for accuracy, but it does actually come out as about 46.26. If you are going to put numbers in, try and keep a couple of decimal places in if you can, just so you don't end up being too far out by the end of the question. Okay, so importantly, you realize that R is smaller because the, the 50 newtons in the string is doing some of the lifting for us. So R does not need to work as hard. Okay, so that's newtons, that's newtons. We've got to show that mu is 0 0.83, so you've got to pretend you don't know that. So what we've got here is a friction, just uh, resisting that motion, the string is mu R. Okay, and we can put that in as 46.26 mu okay so there's all my forces i've sorted out my verticals because i found oh i need to sort out my horizontals now um the box is moving at a constant speed so there's no acceleration 
if there's no acceleration it means that we are in equilibrium so that 38.3 the 50 cos 40 must be equal to the friction which is 46.26 mu and that gives you mu is 0.83 okay it's just a simple case of sort out your verticals sort out your horizontals and if we were accelerating I would have just applied F equals MA at the end. Now the next part of the question is the same box uh, on the same wooden board. So mu is still 0.83 but this time the board has been tilted a little bit like when I showed you my wooden board in class. Now a lot of this is similar. Okay, This is not 50 anymore. This is just now T. Okay, That's what we've got to find. Now the first question was actually to cover this in forces, which you should be doing anyway. So what have we got? We've got T cos 40 going up there. Um, short of working out what cos 40 is, there's not a lot we can do there. We've got T sine 40 there. And again, we could work that out now. I'll probably leave it until later on. Um, we've got, because now we're on a slope, we've got Mg sine theta. Now remember it's still 8 kilograms. The theta for this is the, the angle that the board is at. Okay, so it's 8 times 9.8 times sine 5, which comes out as 6.833. So I've just kept a couple of extra decimal places there. We've got the perpendicular component of the weight, which is mg cos theta. So that's 8 times 9.8 times cos 5 this time which is 78.102. You'd expect that to be a lot bigger for small angles like 5 degrees. We've got our normal contact force. Now, similar to when the, when the object was on a horizontal surface, that tension in the string is affecting our normal contact force. It doesn't need to be as big again. So it's a similar idea. It should be 78.102, but it needs to be less. And that's because of the T sine 40 term. They're both acting in the perpendicular upwards direction. And the 78.102 is in the perpendicular downwards direction. Okay. Um, we've also got friction. Now it says the, board is acceler uh, the block is accelerating up the board at 3 meters per second squared which means the friction is acting down and that's mu r remember we do know what mu is mu is 0 0.83 and r is this sort of complicated term here so there's all your forces and I've included the acceleration as well all we need to do now is working in the perpendicular direction and applying f equals ma as the block is accelerating, work out what T is. So if we take up the slope as positive, we've got one positive force, and that's T cos 40. We've got two negative forces. We've got Mg sine theta, which was 6.833. And we've got mu r, and that's 0.83, which is mu. And then we've got the 78.102 minus t sine 40 that's r and that's all equal to ma 8 times 3 which is going to be 24 okay again some numbers in here then so t cos 40 if we put cos 40 into a calculator is 0.766 t uh, minus 6.833 a little bit of expanding to do here so that comes out as minus 64.825 and be careful of signs here that goes to a plus because you've got two minuses times in each other. Sine 40 is 0.534 when you times it with the 0.83. Okay, so 0.534t and that all equals 24. Um, if you put your t terms together, add in them, remember because two minuses made a plus, you get that 1.3t. Bring the two numerical terms over and add them on, you get 95. 0.658 and then if you divide through you get that t is 73.6 newtons so three significant figures okay 
the biggest problem on that question was missing forces or forces going the wrong direction or not realizing that R was going to be affected by the T sine 40 turn from the string. Okay, if, if you've got all your forces, then generally you went on to get the right answer. People who got the force diagram right got the 73.6 in the end. And the people who struggled to get 73.6, it was because they were somehow wrong at the big, very, very beginning when they put all their forces on. So be careful when you are drawing your diagram. And then on to the last question, which was the projectiles one. And this was uh, not particularly well answered. And I think it was because a lot of people didn't realize what this was for. They've given you the horizontal and vertical components. This is 30 and this is 1.4. Okay. Um, on most of the questions you've done in class, you were given the initial velocity as, as a speed and as an angle and asked to resolve it. And on this question, it's already been done for you. So you can just go straight into working horizontally and vertically. Okay. Now we're told that it hits the ground when the time is four sevenths of a second and we're asked to find the speed when that happens okay so horizontally um, remember that in the horizontal direction the speed is constant so I'll just put it as speed speed is 30 okay the vertical direction is a little more complicated because in the vertical direction we need to use SUVAT because it is going to accelerate so what do we know well, if I take down as positive, just to make life a little bit easier, because the ball isn't going to come back up anyway, U is 1.4, A is 9.8, the time is 4 sevenths of a second, we're trying to find V, because the question is all about speed, and if I use V equals U plus AT, I'll put that in brackets over there, V comes out as exactly 7. Uh, now that's not a speed. Speed is a scalar quantity, not a vector. So to turn a vector into a scalar, you've got to form and find the hypotenuse of a triangle. Remember, that's 30. That's constant. This is now 7. If you use Pythagoras to find the diagonal, you get 30.8 meters per second. That's when it hits the floor. Okay. Second part of the question starts to know what happens when it passes the net. And we're told that it passes the net when t is two fifths of a second, or you could say 0 0.4 in this case, because that does make a nice decimal, four sevenths does not. So find the position vector of the ball after two fifths of a second. So that's how far has it traveled to the right? How far has it traveled downwards? Now we're going to give our position vector from O, that's there, okay? So we're going to give it as an I part and then a J part. Be careful because the number that you work out in a minute is not actually your position vector. You've got to be a little bit careful. Okay, horizontally speaking then. We know the speed is 30 and we're working out distance this time. So we're going to have to put in that the time is 0.4. And if we do speed times time, you get the distance is 12 meters. So I've already found the value of x. Okay, the ball travels 12 meters to the right. I'll add it to my diagram, 12 meters. Then we need to work vertically. Back to the beginning, so u is 1.4, a is 9.8, this time t is 0 0.4 and this time when we're finding position so that's displacement I'm looking for and using ut plus a half at squared I get an answer of 1.34 meters but that's not the position vector 1.34 meters if I go back up 1.34 meters is how far this ball has dropped from an initial height of 2.4 meters. So when I'm given a position vector, what I want to know is how far off the ground is this ball when it passes the net. 
and that's 1.06 meters. So our position vector, and this is going to be in terms of i and j, is 12i plus 1.06j meters. That's the position vector, so that's part i. Um, show the ball clears the net by approximately 16 centimetres. Well, if we're 1.06 metres off the ground and the net is 0.9 metres high, then that gives you your 0.16 or 16 centimetre gap. So that was easy enough once you'd got the 1.34 part. Explain why the observed value is different from the value calculated in BII. Um, lots of things you could put here. Um, air resistance would be a good one. Um, spin on the ball. If you watch tennis, you can see that they get the ball to sort of move in the air uh, unexpectedly using spin. You could have put in anything about like the particle model doesn't take into account the size of the ball. Okay, a bigger ball obviously is a bit harder to get over the net because of the thickness or the, the sort of the diameter of the ball itself. Suggest a possible improvement to this model. I mean, difficult to do, but you could try and include some sort of friction term. So the 30 meters per second horizontally is not constant, okay, or that it doesn't accelerate it downwards at 9.8 meters per second squared because of air resistance. It would be difficult, but that's the sort of thing they're looking for, okay. And that was the last question, okay. It always looks easier when someone else goes through it, but hopefully I've shown you that getting your basics right. So in this case, it's writing down everything you know. When it's forces, it's making sure that all your forces are uh, on the diagram in the right places, point in the right direction, and whether you've got them plus or minus. Okay, but hopefully that's helped. If you're still not sure, obviously come and see me whenever you're free.